When I first started doing my corporate work for research, I remember the day that my boss came up and he said, your group dislikes you so much that they all want to quit. And I was stunned. And that transformation in that moment ultimately set the course why I'm a life coach right now. My boss at this moment, he looks me in the eye and he says, Michael, I really see the potential in you. And if you're open to it, I'll give you a brand new group. You've got to be coachable to really change how you treat your people. And he was true to his word. He was, in a loving way, utterly, utterly ruthless. And he took apart every email I sent. He disassembled every meeting I ran and would carefully but consistently point out, you're doing this, you're saying this, here's how it's being received, and here's why it's not coming across the way you want it. So much so that two years later, when I was running another meeting that one of those original four people in my first group was present in, we were walking out the door and he grabs me by the shoulders, almost kind of roughly, he's like, Michael, we got to talk. He pulls me into this other conference room and he looks me in the eye and he says, what happened to you? Two years ago, I hated your guts. You were the worst guy I could ever imagine working for. But I just came out of a meeting where I respected you and I wanted to learn about what you're doing. So I need to know what happened to you because I want some of that too. Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about helping men live meaningful and fulfilling lives. I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Michael Jaquith. Dr. Michael is a PhD chemist who left the corporate world to become a faith-based life coach for men. You can reach Dr. Michael at his website, catholiclifecoachformen.com, and I'll include a link in the show notes. Welcome, Michael. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. Linda, thank you so much for having me. It's a delight to be here, and I'm very excited for our conversation. I am too, and I'm so excited to hear your story, and I'm assuming there is one, because after you get your PhD in chemistry, usually the career path does not lead you to be a faith-based life coach. So I'm assuming that something happened between point A and point B that's going to be important for our conversation today. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me just give you kind of just a very brief introduction to what might be setting it up. I had a pretty rough childhood. And in my childhood, I ran away from God, got very angry, and kind of looked at building this PhD career as a way to take control of my own life. And that's important to know, because when I move into why I switched, we have to have that I had a bumpy start. And to kind of set the stage, when I first started doing my, in, my corporate work for research, I remember the day that my boss came up and he said, your group dislikes you so much that they all want to quit. And I was stunned. And not to let too much out too quickly, but that transformation in that moment ultimately set the course why I'm a life coach right now. Ouch. That sounds like a horrible day. A horrible day. It so, was a rough one. It's true. Wow. Well, I think a lot of it was that I really didn't understand how to make other people feel seen and wanted and appreciated. You know, a lot of the things that some people just take for granted when they come from a healthier beginning home. My dad was pretty abusive. My mother was pretty absentee and checked out. And I don't think that I had that skill set. And I think what I particularly did, I was particularly blind to how much I was just little things stabbing people. But maybe continue the story on here just a little bit. My boss at this moment, he looks me in the eye and he says, Michael, I really see the potential in you. And if you're open to it, I'll give you a brand new group. You've got to be coachable to really change how you treat your people. And he was true to his word. He was, in a loving way, utterly, utterly ruthless. And he took apart every email I sent. He disassembled every meeting I ran and would carefully but consistently point out, you're doing this, you're saying this, here's how it's being received, and here's why it's not coming across the way you want it. So much so that two years later, when I was running another meeting that one of those original four people in my first group was present in, as we're hit, I hadn't seen him in two years. We're walking out the door and he grabs me by the shoulder. His name is Josh. Almost kind of roughly, he's like, Michael, we got to talk. He pulls me into this other conference room and he looks me in the eye and he says, what happened to you? Two years ago, I hated your guts. You were the worst guy I could ever imagine working for. But I just came out of a meeting where I respected you and I wanted to learn about what you're doing. So I need to know what happened to you because I want some of that too. Okay. Guess what, Michael? I want some of that too. Okay. So how do we get from where you were to where you are now, I know when you start with a rough background and you're not able to see people and you're not able to give those things, it really starts with what we have inside. And so I am assuming that you did not feel seen, that you did not feel heard, and 
and you had not had that modeled, you don't know what to do, and you, you don't even know that that's an option because that's not something that you experienced. So now you do. So what magic did your boss do that changed you? Well, you're spot on, of course, right, Linda. As, as always, whenever there's a problem that with our nurses and else, the problem is coming from inside of us. What he really taught me to do was to be present with people, to listen to them. What he taught me why it's important to hear the person, not just the data. So I've got this, you know, engineering science mindset, and I would sit down and it was just ruthless. What would you the person down to just the information they had? And that was their value to me at the time. And, you know, Linda, I, I hate to say it this way, but I think a lot of times we still do that at home, in our marriages, in our lives. It's so easy to enter a transactional style relationship where the value of another person becomes what they can provide for me. And don't get me wrong, I enjoy a good service professional as much as the next. But I think even if, say, I'm paying someone to cut my hair at a barbershop or, or paying a waitress at a restaurant, if all I see in that person is the transaction, then I lose the meaning of what that relationship is supposed to be. And this is one of the things my boss taught me is how to see the people. One of his things he did that was so cool is in an environment that was super high stress, super busy, he carved out time in his calendar every day, walked to individual people's cubicles and just be with them, just talk to them, see what's going on in their life, connect with them, hear what was important to them, hear like what was what was their heartbeat, what were their fears, what were the concerns. He built that trust and that is transformational. Wow. I wish everyone could have someone like that in their life. And so that is why we are having this conversation to give a little bit of that and make it as available to as many people as possible so they can have a taste of what is possible and then to give the information so that it becomes obtainable. And that's huge. It really is. And I love that you work specifically with men because I believe we all have issues. Sometimes men don't like to think that they have any, you know, especially don't go with emotions and cred and stuff like that. But we do. And it helps to have someone that is, that understands and that gets it and can come from that place of commonality so that I believe you. I believe you because I think you know what you're talking about. I was totally tracking with you. And let's, let's, let's talk just for a moment just about men. And whenever I say I want to talk about men, I do not in any way mean to diminish the experience of women in any way whatsoever. But just to speak about men, and I think men, there's a lot of men, myself historically included, that would say something like, I don't even have feelings. Maybe anger, maybe lust. Those are the two feelings men tend to feel okay having. But outside of those two, like, no, I'm a robot. I don't even have feelings. But here's where that leads, Linda, and I didn't know this at the time. This was one of the things that hit me so hard. When I don't allow myself to experience my own feelings, and I become afraid of somebody else's feelings. And when I see somebody else's having an emotion, in other words, being human, I withdraw. I pull away. It's too scary. It's too much. I'm going to run. They're going to medicate. You know, this time of my life, I was dealing with some alcohol, with some pornography. Like, there's a lot of ways to medicate, to numb the terror the sense of helplessness out of these feelings that we just don't know what to do with. And so I think men right now, in general, not of course all of them, but especially men from a rough background, are not taught how to deal with their emotions, not taught how to just be with them, not even taught that it's okay to have them. My dad did not allow any emotions in the family. Like, unless the blood was gushing, there weren't even tears allowed in my face. I mean, it had to be, it had to be like volumetrically measurable blood before it was even allowable. And I grew up with no clue how to connect with another human being who had feelings. Because I didn't know my own. And I remember the first day that someone taught me how to just sit and to feel something. I'm like, this is horrible. Why would anyone ever want to do this? But at the same time, as someone now who's gone through that work learning how to do, I can equally as well ask, why would anyone not want to go through that because of how good of a place it leads us to? Okay, that's huge. So in this this small a little bit of information, you talked about the feelings that men feel like they are allowed. And there are really pretty much two, and it's anger and lust. We're allowed to have those two. Those are manly, masculine emotions. 
And it's interesting that when you talked about how when you see or experience someone else feeling an emotion, it feels scary. And no one wants to feel any sort of fear or feel afraid because fear makes us feel weak, where anger gives a false sense of power. So if I feel afraid, if I feel like I am not enough, if I feel any of those fearful based emotions, it's normal and natural to switch it into anger because anger feels more powerful, but it doesn't bring any happiness or joy to yourself and not to anyone around you. And so I I appreciate that you mentioned that because I think it's very important to start with with what is the norm? What is the expectation? And especially if you haven't had an experience with a man who allowed himself to have any other feelings beyond those basic two. And I loved when you talked about having experiencing it, that it was scary. And then it became empowering. And I think that is very important that we recognize, okay, If we're going to ask you to do something hard or uncomfortable, that it is worth it by the time we're done. And that matters. So can you explain a little bit more about why this is worth it to you? How how has it made your life better? Let's say I'm I'm a man and I, I only have those two emotions. Those are the only ones that I feel comfortable with. Anything else makes me just squeamish. Why do I want to do this? I think that's such a good question. And I want to just real quickly acknowledge, you called anger a false powerful or a pretend, I forget the word. I agree, that's so so true and so well said. But if I'm a man, if I'm talking to a man, if you're a listener, if you're listening, you're a man, and maybe you're an Indiana Jones, you know, devotee of style, and you're like, yeah, those two are great, everything else, nope, like maybe I've got some secret shame, but I can't talk about that. Here's what I want to invite you to. It's easy to pretend as a guy that we can just go through life without emotions, but the reality is they are there. They really are. And they come at us in our moments when we are the most hurt, when we're the most wounded. They come at us in moments. They should be coming in moments where they're positive, but those are easier to stifle down. Like it's easier to suppress joy, I think, than it is to really suppress shame. And my invitation to you is to consider what would it be like if you didn't have to be alone in that place? And I think so much the human experience, and I'm going to go to the religious here for just a second, if I may. And I even will go so far as to say, I think the devil's job is to divide us. That's why the Diablos comes to the Latin dividing. And when the devil divides one human off by themselves, it makes them feel like they're all alone in suffering with no one else there to support. It's one of the most powerful ways to crush a human soul there is. And speaking as a man who's been in that spot where I've been alone, or not, not, truly alone, as God sees it, I wasn't alone. But as I saw it, I was alone. And I was so crushed. And I thought, there's no one else here, just me. And deep down, I kind of knew I wasn't really strong enough to carry that. And when you're in that spot, there's a desperation that comes. And guys, if you're in that spot, you know what I'm talking about. There's that desperation that says, I have to do anything to not feel like this. You can turn to any coping technique you want. Just get out of feeling like this. But here's my claim to you. If you're willing to actually put that risk, take that, if you take the courage and really offer this to somebody else, you're going to discover that you're not alone, that other people have those feelings too. Not only that, but that when you experience these negative emotions, these doubts, these fears, and share them with someone who's trustworthy, don't find some random person to share it with, has to be trustworthy, that there's a lessening of the load, that your heart will lift a little bit. And there's a connection that brings meaning and purpose. And it, guys, if you're married, your wife is desperate for this sort of connection. You know, as guys, when we get married, it's a slight off topic, but I think it ties it in. We are so desperate for a physical connection. And we forget or don't allow ourselves to see that we weren't made for just that. We're made for so much more. And my invitation to you is, if you're a guy, typically, I know this is in universe, but commonly, the level of connection you feel through the physical connection He's only a small piece of the puzzle what can be available, whether it's with your wife or a different quarter, say with friends. That emotional connection is so powerful and brings such not only relief, but joy and hope 
in all the different fruits of the spirit can come when we are willing to make that share. And as terrifying as it is, and it is terrifying, I will challenge you to say to your listener that having gone through their side, it would be more terrifying to not go. Wow, that was so beautiful. Okay, you have convinced me. I'm I'm in. I'm ready to do this so that I don't feel so alone. I don't feel like I have to carry this burden alone. And I have connection and I want that. I don't want to feel that misery of feeling so isolated. Okay, you have given me some wonderful reasons. And in that explanation, you also touched on something that is extremely common. And that is when we're feeling that pain of any kind, especially emotional pain, I want to distract myself. I want to numb it. And that leads to addiction. And that's one of the things that you help with is addictions to, you know, any kind of substance or to pornography. These are very common distractions that people, they're just their go-to to to kind of not feel the pain. So what can we do to, to, to get over those addictions? And, and do I even want to get over that addiction? I mean, if I feel like it's working, why stop? Well, I think that's a great starting point. And let me start by saying that a lot of people in the Christian community really do not do a great job supporting people stuck in addictions. And I know that they mean very well, but particularly pornography is one of the ones that really is difficult for people, I think, to understand. And I want to start by saying that, of course, pornography is an objective evil. Like, I'm not in any way trying to support its spread and use. Like, what happens, most of the stories of most of the women trapped in there are really, really horrible. But that said, we need to understand that the typical guy or girl addicted to pornography is not a horrible person. They're still a person made in the image of God, and that they are most likely very, very desperate. And so when you have somebody who doesn't have a connection, it's like you're drowning. And here's this one periodic gasp of air. And you're, and that person can sometimes feel like you're saying, so you're telling me I've got to give up the only chance to breathe I even have. And the rest of the time, I'll just be drowning. And of course, like who would ever say yes to that right away? That just sounds terrifying to even think about that. And before we can even really deal with what the addiction is, we have to deal with what's really missing in the heart. The addiction came in because it was trying to fill something. There's a different gap there. And you can't just take it away and be like, cool, now you get no breathing. Enjoy. Goodbye. I'm sure this worked out great for you. Like, it it just doesn't work that way. And so when I work with a guy who is suffering with an addiction, and and I need to be very sensitive here because that was me for so many years. First thing I do is start to rebuild that ability to connect, that rebuild the ability to connect to God. Most of us, when we are in an addiction, have closed the door to God. We don't want what he has to offer. We build the ability to connect to others around us. We're terrified. We don't trust them. We don't trust God. You know, if any of the God, any of the above people were good, we wouldn't have gotten here in the first place. Not worth opening that door. I have one way to breathe. I'm sticking with my one way. And as we rebuild those connections and start to come above water in other areas of our life, it gets easier to let go. Not, not easy, but easier to let go of that behavioral pattern. That's so important. And, and as you're talking about this compassion for the person first, and again, I think it's very important to recognize that we're not just dealing with an addiction. There is an underlying cause trying to fill a, a black hole of, of emptiness. And it doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't really make us happy. But like you said, it's that breath of air. And that, um, and it matters. It matters that we're working in layers. And I think for anyone who is trying to overcome an addiction, if they try to do that without addressing those underlying issues, they're not going to be very successful. I think sometimes they just trade one thing for another. I've seen that story a lot, unfortunately. I think a lot of times this is why, well, I have deep respect for, say, the 12-step groups and all that. I think if you don't have the underlying infrastructure work going at the same time, it's a very difficult effort to be successful. But but I also want to give you some hope that, you know, I think a lot of people have this idea that we are broken once we've gone far enough in an addiction. And if you're a listener who thinks that, I want to invite you that there's no such thing as too broken for God. One of the great tragedies of the 21st century, well, I applaud our technological marvels, 
when we as 21st century people have something that's broken, what do we do? We throw it away. And so when we apply the word to ourselves and we say, oh, I'm broken, what do I do? I throw myself away. And that sounds like a silly thing, but it happens no. regularly. Uh, many types of addictions are, in fact, a slow form of suicide. Mm -hmm. But that's not how God does broken. God doesn't see broken as throw away. Did you know, Linda, that if you break a bone and you set the bone and you put it in the cast, it heals. When the bone is healed, there's actually more bone mass present than before the break. It's actually a stronger bone afterwards than it was before. I, I wouldn't, it's unfortunate if I went through an ACL injury about oh, 10 years ago now. Oh, that's a tough one to recover from. If you're an ACL injury, my heart goes out to you. But afterwards with proper therapy, you can end up stronger than you were before. And this is my invitation to you guys and gals listening. If you think you're broken, if you feel like there's just not enough left to be worth to save, God can heal that and make it stronger than before. And that's kind of my story. Like I went through all of it. I was broken as they come. And now God, through the grace of God, here I am with the ability to help others heal as well. And reaching out to God as that source of power to heal what is broken is not popular in our society today. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, we don't, we want to pretend that he doesn't exist. And that uh, makes me sad because as we try to heal, we can only use those tools that we are open to. And like so you said, if we're, if we're in that space where the only tool that I'm going to use is my addiction, that's as far as you're going to heal, which is not at all. In fact, you're going to go down. But if you can open it up to these are the tools that I am willing to look at. I am willing to look at healing my past, healing my trauma, addressing the underlying issues and inviting God to help me, then all of a sudden you have this full tool belt with all the awesome equipment that you need to be able to create something beautiful. And so I, I appreciate that you are willing um, to add, add this, to address this, to base it on this even, because it works. It really does. You know, that in my certification process, I got to do a lot of coaching for people who were of more secular orientation. And, and Lord love them. They're great people. And I'm going to share one story real quickly because I think this is so powerful. There's one, one client I was working with, and she was an emotional eater. And in the story, she her husband is traveling, and she bakes an entire tray of brownies, sits down, puts on her favorite TV show, and proceeds to eat the entire tray of brownies. Now, Obviously, from a purely mathematical center objective, it may not be the best thing to eat a whole tray of brownies in one city. But what happens through her brokenness? Her shame cycle starts up. Oh my gosh, you're the worst person ever. You ate the whole stinking tray of brownies. How horrible person are you? Shame cycle, shame cycle. She ramps up. She goes to the pantry, and pulls out the next delicate dessert and ties into that. And I think we did some great coaching that day that really identified her patterns. And as a tool belt, we found some great things for her to do. But now I'm going to tell you a parallel story of almost the same thing. I was working with a guy, but in the Christian perspective. Because then I brought Jesus into the room. And I said to him, look at the face of our Lord and Savior as you're right now in the depths of the shame cycle. And his first said to me, oh, Jesus is so mad at me. I said, pause. I don't think you're looking at Jesus right now. Look closer. Imagine Jesus looking at someone else at the same thing. He just bursts into tears. He says he does still love me. And the healing there went so much deeper. And not that the first person didn't also find some success through coaching, but the second person found a deep, vibrant river of love, accessible way to them there from our Lord himself, that just is the game changer that takes things to such a deeper level. I love that. And it is frustrating to get stuck in the shame cycle and how beautiful it is to have someone who loves us. And love really is the healing key we need to learn to love ourselves, and we need to trust in God's love for us. I think it's very common and normal to think, yeah, he loves people, that one and that one and that one, but not this one. And, right. and it, it feels like, no, not me, not me. I'm the exception. You are spot on. At the core of so many guys' fears is that deep down they're afraid they're not good enough, they're not worth it, they'll never be good enough, they'll never be a man, they'll never be lovable, not good enough to love. 
And and it oftentimes manifests as a self-hatred, although they probably would not articulate it that way. But the way that they set about then to systematically punish themselves is, is so horrible. Like he, most people, we all have this experience. The way that we speak to ourselves in our own head is worse than we would ever tolerate somebody else speaking to someone else. Like if I walked up and heard the same the flow of words that tend regularly takes place in my head, but somebody else was saying it to one of my children, whew, I would go ballistic. I'd be like, no, you do not talk to them that way. But we allow it in our own heads towards ourselves. And it's exactly what you said. We have to learn to see ourselves as lovable and then go the next step and even love ourselves. Right. So I love action steps. I love things that I can do to help that. So let's say I'm in this spot where I don't like myself and I don't think God loves me. I'm in a shame cycle. Can you give me some practical steps to help me climb out of this place of darkness? I think one of the biggest lies the devil persuades us of is that something's too much. It's too overwhelming. And so a lot of times, just even if you're a person right now that's stuck in one of these, just to get out a piece of paper and start getting really, really honest with yourself. Write down, why are you upset? What are you ashamed of? What does it mean? And start digging, because deep down, there's some lies in your heart. And you may not make this on your own very far, but make it as far as you can get. And then just pray with that. And then just offer that to the Lord. You're allowed to, I think a lot of people don't realize they're allowed to be angry at God. A lot of us are like, okay, church time has started. Everyone have your bow ties on and hats on straight. Only the proper emotions now. And God is the creator of all of that is human. And he knows. So like, it's not like you're fooling him. Like, you're actually mad at him. He knows. <laughs> like it's, you pull one over on God. Good job, buddy. And I want to encourage you, get as far as you can go with this exercise of digging. Find out what it is. And then really genuinely offer it up to our Lord in prayer, in real prayer, where you get visceral. And just listen to what he has to say. Because it may shock you. He does not respond to us the way that we expect him to. That is huge. And I've had a personal experience of feeling like I, I was so angry at God. I was so angry. And I was trying to, as you mentioned, you know, bow tie and hutch and do all the things. And, um, and it was really not until I was honest and, and it was a, I guess you could call it a prayer, but it involved a lot of yelling where it was just, um, that the healing was able to begin. So that, uh, the permission to be angry at God. And it's different when it's just, I mean, there are a lot of people who are mad at God, but, um, but to be mad at God and then to come to him, not to be mad at him and say, well, forget you and leave but to, to come and ask for some help and ask for some clear or, you know, some healing. I think that makes the difference. And to speak your truth, to speak your truth clearly. This is really what's going on with me, God. This is my deepest fear. This is my self-doubt. My wife once said to me, this was a great insight on her part. She said to me, honey, I feel like you're just being mad at me, but you, you're not helping by yelling at me. You need to go have this up, God, first. And she was spot on. And the truth is, I love my wife, but God is stronger than my wife. And God can take my anger. It won't hurt him. That's not true of my wife. If I get angry at my wife, I can cause harm there. But when I can go to God and say, God, I am mad as a hornet. You dropped the ball on this. You dropped the ball on this. And I don't know what you're doing with this one here, but this one certainly ain't going right either. That level of authenticity sets the stage for you actually to be open. Because when you really put that out there with God and really show up, there's an openness in your heart. You hear what comes next. And that matters. We have to be able to hear what comes next. Because as we're mm -hmm. looking for direction, we're looking for healing, we're looking for something to fill that space, that emptiness. And it's really, God is the best one to fill it. He's the one with the power to do it. Um, and so we need to be open. I love that. Wow, this has been delightful. Is there anything that you want to make sure that we cover today before we close? I think, you know, the one thing I really want to invite the guys out there, if you're listening to this, is go out and invest yourself in really good friendships. Invest your time. And uh, just a real brief aside, I don't know that the word friend has been hurt more than when Facebook took that word and used it to apply to the types of connections that you get online. We have 10,000 Facebook friends. Mm. And a real friend is not that at all. A real friend is someone 
that you have built up trust and connection with. And when you sit down with them and they sit down with you and they say, how are you doing, Bob? And you say, I'm doing fine. They stop in your eye say, how would you really do? What's really happening in your life? In that moment, you know that you're free to share the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that Bob will sit there and talk with you and be present with you through your struggles. And this sort of friendship isn't just given away, it's earned. You have to put the time in for it. But that this sort of friendship is the primary vehicle by which God designed the human-human connection to help us to become better people. And if all you have is what I call sideline friends, where you're like, the sideline friends, you're at the game, you're on the sidelines, you're cheering for your team, you're talking about the weather, complaining about the hot dogs, whatever. Sideline friends don't help us become better. You need this deeper level of friendship. Invest the time in it. And if your current friends don't want to come deeper, find new friends. It's worth it. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for visiting with me today. Linda, it's been a delight. Thank you so much for having me on. It's been a pleasure for me as well. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Indian spiritual leader Dada Vaswani. He said, true success, true happiness lies in freedom and fulfillment. Today, I invite our listeners to enjoy the happiness and fulfillment that comes by living a meaningful life. See you next time on Linda's Corner. Thanks for listening. Please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. And if you'd like to heal your life from the inside out, there is a free video series at HopeForHealingFoundation.org. Just click on the free stuff tab. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed, A Journey Through Depression, and You Got This, an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner. 